Shall we open in prayer? Let's pray. Father, we thank you. And once again, we have this opportunity to be able to come together and to study your word, to learn about your character, to learn about this incredible experience Moses had with you and the people of Israel as they learned to discover more about who you are and to, to understand that you are the God who, who desires to be known. And as we venture through more of, of Exodus and this, this journey on Sinai, so speak to us and help us to apply it to our day. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Great. Well, so <clears throat> last week we learned how Moses got fit on Mount Sinai. Um, he went up and down eight times. And for an 80-year-old, or at this stage probably around about 81, 82 years old, uh, he was very fit to be able to make that climb eight times. And it wasn't sort of one climb a year. It was several climbs and uh, um, of, over a short period of time. So if any of you have ever climbed Bluff Knoll, um, uh, well, I guess it's probably similar to that kind of experience, um, having to go up a fairly large mountain um, although Bluff Knoll's not, not that large. Um, so we don't really know <clears throat> exactly how high um, this particular mountain um, is and at which point Moses was at, but it would have been a reasonable climb. And so um, today we'll just take a few moments to, to just orientate ourselves as to um, where we're going to be looking at out of these eight times that Moses went up and down. And uh, <clears throat> if you've read through this section in your Bibles, maybe several times you've read through it, you, you may not have captured it in this way. Because normally when we read through something, we don't take the time to sit down and read it in one sitting and then look for all the intricate details, unless we've got some kind of guided through reading that we're looking at. So this gives us the opportunity of some kind of guided through. So just to recap, they arrive at Sinai. Um, Moses is called up um, to Mount Sinai, up, up on top of Mount Sinai. He meets with God. God tells him the covenant. So they are told that he's told the terms of the covenant. He comes down, Israel commits to that covenant. They say, yes, we will be happy to be able to be part of this covenant. Moses goes back up again. or, or so, um, um, Yahweh comes down or tells him he's going to come down upon the mountain. Um, when he goes up, he says, I'm going to come down on the mountain. Um, he goes down and tells the people that Yahweh is going to come down upon the mountain that they need to do um, certain, certain things to prepare themselves. Um, he goes back up again. Um, they're told to <clears throat> um, how they are to prepare themselves in order for Yahweh to come down. Um, um, he comes down. He tells them that they've got to prepare themselves. This is basically what um, the law that you are going to be given. Um, and um, Moses goes back up again. Um, he's given what's known as the Book of the Covenant. He comes back down again. The people all agree. We will do this. Now, at this point, you kind of read this and you think to yourself, I'm not sure how many of them have really actually thought through this. As to um, uh, how much are they committing to? Do they understand what a Sererian uh, treaty really is about. Do, do, do they understand the implications of that if they don't fulfill this, what's going to happen to them? Maybe they were on two highs. One is the high of coming out of Egypt, and the other is the high of wanting to go back to Egypt. So they, they're in two different places, and they're now having to make this covenant. And what they do know about Yahweh is that he came and rescued them from Egypt. He uh, beat the snot out of the uh, Egyptian gods. 
the army was left decimated, um, floating in the Red Sea. Um, not one person lifted a hand in order to, about to do that. God did it all on his own. They brought into the desert. They came to a place where the springs of Mara, where there was bitter water. God healed the waters. They've seen these miracles happening. God has led them to this place, to this mountain. What they know about him is that if he got angry with them, <laughs> what's going to happen to them? They don't know too much about the gentle nature of, of who Yahweh is. They know he's a God who will rescue, and he does a very good job at it. But who else is he? So this covenant of that he will be their God and they will be his people, yes, okay, we will do that. But we really don't know you. And so... We know that what happens next is that um, um, Moses, the um, say some significant people, Aaron and two other guys and 70 elders, go up the mountain and they fulfill the signing of this covenant deal. Known as a uh, Suzerian Treaty. Um, which is, just to remind you of it, it is when one party who is far greater um, gets into a covenant with somebody who is far less powerful, and the greater will look after the less powerful. Um, but there are conditions. And the conditions are, you will obey. Um, and they agree to it. And so, they go and do this, they eat this meal up on top of the mountain, they come down, and it is as though, well, everything from here is now going to work. And now Moses must go back up again. He takes Joshua with him. He leaves Joshua at a certain point and he carries on further, further up. And um, Moses is now given all the understandings of what will happen in that tabernacle. How to set it up, what it's to be made of all the uh, furnishings that will go in the tabernacle, the priests, how they must dress, how they must um, behave within the tabernacle, what their functions are, this whole thing regarding the, re the representation of what it will mean for them to be a nation who will be atoned for is given. During this time, remember they've just signed the treaty, during this time, Moses going up to get all these details. This is what we're going to be looking at where they start to make the golden calf. Okay, so um, just for a moment in your own minds, think. How many times have you, and I've, I've answered this question for myself and I didn't score very high on it. But how many times have you, when you've made promises to God, that the words haven't even yet cooled down out of your mouth and you've already broken it. Think how many times. Lord, I promise I will never do that again. Lord, I promise uh, if you take away this problem from me, I will do this for you for the rest of my life. Lord, if only you showed yourself to me, I will do far greater things for you. We are not very good at keeping promises. Think of it for yourself, just for a few moments. Think through. We're just like the Israelites. See, it's human nature. It's, it's sin dwelling within us that causes us to do that. And even though we are right before God and we can see him, we will still do it. And notice, um, Aaron takes on a primary role here in this part of the story. He has seen the um, lapis lazuli pavement where God is seated on. He has been in the presence of God. 
a physical manifestation of the presence of God, not as a vision, an actual seeing. He's come down the mountain, he's on more likely that spiritual high, and now the story picks up. This is Exodus chapter 32. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, we know that he was going up for 40 days, 40, 40 nights, whether that was actually 40 days and 40 nights, or whether it was just a way of saying that it's a long period of time, we don't know. But we know that it was a long period of time that he had gone up. Whichever way one wants to understand it, it's perfectly fine. It's just really, in a sense, at the end of the day, admitting that it was a long period of time because, because the nation was saying, he's gone for a long time. What's happened to him? So they start to grow impatient and they're beginning to worry. Has something happened to Moses? After all, he is of a senior age. Something has happened to him. So now they approach Aaron. Remember where Aaron had been. Right in God's presence. <coughs> when the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, make, come, come and make us gods. Um, some translations will use just the singular God. Whether it's gods or God. We're not too sure, um, but they've chosen to, to translate it from the Hebrew as meaning gods. Who will go before us? Um, as for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. Could be lying there on the mountain, fallen over a rock, died. God could have taken him. We don't know. So we need something. Now, Notice, Aaron does not fight against them. Neither do the other fellows who went with Aaron or the 70 elders. Nobody pulls him to one side and says, no, hang on, Aaron, this, no, no, don't do this. Don't, don't do this. No. Aaron just says, well, take off your gold earrings. Now, there must have been a lot because they plundered Egypt. Take off the gold earrings that your, your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing. If we had to say, say 25% of that population, or we're talking about probably close to um, 3 million people, if it's 25%, well, looking at, um, say, 800,000 pairs of earrings, gold earrings, that's a lot of gold. Massive amount of, of gold. Uh, take it off and bring it to me. So the people took off the earrings and brought it to Aaron. He took what had been handed to him and made it into an idol cast in the shape of a calf. Okay, so, so what we've got here now is um, there is no clear Egyptian god that is a calf. There's a bull. But there's no clear one that is a calf. This is something that they have made up in their own mind. So it's not something that has come from Egypt. Uh, something they've made up in their own minds. It's a calf, but it's a symbol of domestication. If you can domesticate something, you make an image of something that is a domesticated animal. So you've got to ask yourself the question, why, why do they need to domesticate God? Any ideas? Why would they need to do that? Because they want to control him. They want to control him? Yes. Why would you think that they would want to control him? It's all about them. It's about them, yes. But think about the experience that they've had. What is the experience of Yahweh like up to this point? Almost an angry God. I think maybe he's an angry God. Yeah. Yes. Um, how would have you felt 
coming out of Egypt, seeing God doing these 10 plagues, coming out of Egypt in a rush, going through the Red Sea. and so, um, Your idea of God, what, what would have it been? Okay, he is fearsome. You don't mess with him. Oh, yes. I would have been scared, phew, petrified. So the need to try to domesticate him. If you can make him into something that is not as threatening, then, 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 then it's easier for us to deal with him. We've signed this treaty, this covenant with him. He's fearsome. And now if we can make him into a calf, we are on almost equal terms. Do you see a pattern starting to arise here that we struggle with? It's also partly about they're trying to put it into some sort of context that they can understand. We could say they're trying to put it into a context that they understand, some kind of frame of reference. Remember, the Egyptian gods, even though they never worshipped the Egyptian gods, they were still surrounded by the Egyptian gods, those Egyptian gods were manageable. Okay, they never saw them doing anything. Well, that would be wrong, I guess, because they did stand a lot. <laughs> um, so they were doing something. It probably looked a lot like council workers who work on the side of the road. Stand a lot. So that's probably about as much. But experience. He's fearsome. How do we deal with him? Let's domesticate him. Let's bring him down to somebody that we can deal with. So they make this, this golden calf. And now it gets worse. Um, so now they, um, they've got this idol. We go up to verse 4. They've, they've fashioned it. Um, and then verse 5. Um, Aaron, when Aaron saw this, this God that's been made, and that, they has, um, that it was said, yeah, we look in verse 4, end of verse 4, it says, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. In other words, this is Yahweh. Okay, this is not an Egyptian God, because the Egyptian gods were defeated. This is Yahweh, who brought you up out of Egypt. He's now manageable. He's not that scary. He does exactly what the Egyptian gods do. He just stands. <laughs> he doesn't do anything. He's no longer threatening. Now, in verse Five it says when Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, "Tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord." Now look in your Bibles. Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. That's the English translation for the use of the word Yahweh. We will now have a festival to Yahweh. So Aaron, now in your minds, think of this: Aaron has been part of this whole journey. Almost from the beginning. When Moses um, um, was at the burning bush, and remember he wanted to deny five times for God to use him. Then God says, well, okay, your brother Aaron is on his way. And he will pick up from there. So Aaron has been through this whole process all along. Now, just a piece of information I want you to take and try and just file it somewhere, just somewhere just existing, just around your head here somewhere so that we can grab hold of it just now. Why did God get angry with Moses at the burning bush? Remember five times and Moses was denying it five times. Why did God get angry with him? When you go and read the story, you will see that Moses was not believing the character of God. He was believing in his own capacity, but not the character of God. Okay, so let's keep that there for a moment. So now they've built this altar, and they're using the, that which was taught them from up on top of the mountain. 
Remember, they were told about three festivals that they will learn about, uh, that, that they will celebrate. It is um, um, the day of uh, Passover. It's the, um, I was going to get, well, I've written them down here now because I'm going all over my notes. Um, if I don't get it right here, I'll come back to it in a couple of moments. But they th taught three festivals up on top of that mountain. And they told harvest, harvest which and is Pentecost. In gathering. The, uh, the end of the year when you get a crop from the field. Yes, in gathering and Passover. Those are the three that they were taught. Passover, Pente Pentecost, and Tabernacles are the three that they were told. Which, also just something just for... Um, so for interest's sake, those three all focus on the Messianic age. Mm. Okay, so something, uh, just a bit of trivia. Bit of trivia. Okay, so <laughs> you're playing some Bible trivia. Uh, so that whole principle of those, how you celebrate those, they're now taking the things, the method, and they're going to use this. And... You've got Moses up on top of the mountain learning how this whole thing must work and they're taking it and they're inventing a whole other liturgy to Yahweh. The golden calf and an altar that is now uh, manufactured and put before this golden calf. Tomorrow we'll have this festival to the Lord. In other words, forget about the other three festivals you've, you've been told. We'll have this festival. So the next day the people rose early and sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. So they know already that there is some form of liturgy that you must engage with in the temple that they've been told. And they take that and they pervert it. And then what do they do? Afterwards they sat down to eat and drink. Okay, that's the sign of signing a covenant. And then they did something else and got up to indulge in revelry. Okay, what does that mean? Okay, somebody just said a rude word. <laughs> Orgies. Yeah. I started to get physical with each other. Got out of hand. <laughs> yes. Got out of hand. This is what they're doing now. In their minds, this is how you worship Yahweh. See how they see how they perverted it? And Aaron has been along the whole time. And here's he officiating priest over it. This becomes quite scary <laughs> when you realize that, that this is what they're up to. Uh, continue with verse 7. Um, then the Lord said to Moses, Go down because your people. Not my people any longer. Your people. God now separates himself because he's holy. Now, for a moment, just uh, this is some of the stuff that we we lose in the modern church. And yes, they lost this in the um, um, early church. They lost it in the Middle Ages. They, um, uh, but we're losing it in our modern way. In our in in the modern church, is that when worship becomes an unholy thing, God separates Himself from it. He doesn't accept it. He says no. And so, yes, there are ways that are done in terms of worship, attitudes within ourselves, um, attitudes within um, a worship team, attitudes within a church, attitudes um, from the pastor. Um, um, we always are front line there to be able to be judged first. Um, attitudes that, that are from the wider church community as to saying that's the way we think that Yahweh or that God should be worshipped. And we don't go back to what scripture says. 
we think that this will be the best because this is the way we are happiest with. And now there is a style, there is a form of liturgy that is not in accordance with who he is. And he says, your people. So now, Moses has to do something. <laughs> and he said, go down because your people whom you brought up out of Egypt have become corrupt. They have been quick to turn away from what I commanded them and have made themselves an idol cast in the shape of a calf and have bound down to it and sacrificed. These are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. I have seen these people, the Lord said to Moses, they are a stiff-necked people. What's a stiff-necked? What does that mean? Change, Refuse to change, unbending. Yeah? Yes, I'll do it my way. I think I know better. You know what teenagers are like from around about age, probably around age 14 till about 22? Mm. They believe they know everything. I've had to say to well, with with all of them, we've, we've had this conversation. When I say to them, I know you've just discovered this for the first time and you're excited about knowing this. But let me tell you, there are many people out there who know far more than you do. And just because you've discovered it for the first time doesn't mean to say that you know it. Um, that's part of being a stiff net. We've just discovered worship. Now we'll define it. God says, no, you stiff net. Get away. Now he says, verse 10 says, says <laughs> Moses, now leave me alone. <laughs> leave me alone. Go away. That's a, that's a sobering passage. Leave me alone. He says, um, um, so that my anger may burn against them and I may destroy them, then I will make you into a great nation. Now, you, you, you can see Moses more than likely going, like, hang on a second, I'm not even getting this. Okay, first of all, my anger will burn against them. Like, okay, we have just seen Egypt. We don't want your anger to burn. We don't want that. And then you're going to say, now you're going to make a great nation. Out of whom? Because <laughs> you're just going to wipe the whole lot out. Out of whom are you going to make this great nation? But what God's doing, God's not at odds with himself. God is testing to see whether Moses, remember the thing I told you that keep up there, whether he has actually understood the character of God. He's seeing whether, whether something along the whole journey he has been on, whether something has actually settled into his head. As the going, Moses, has it settled? Have you got it yet? Yes, I can be a very angry God, but have you got it? Let's test you. And see, so Moses starts with his first plea. Verse 11. But Moses sought the favor of the Lord, his God. Lord, he said, why should your anger burn against your people? <laughs> so now there's a fight. It's yours, no, it's yours. No, it's yours, no, it's yours. <laughs> against your people. Okay. This is your people. And God says, no, no, these are your people. No, but God, they are your people. <laughs> Whom you, you, you brought them out of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand. So he recognizes that. He knows that if he had to use this power and mighty hand against the nation, oh, there's not going to be a nation. And then how is there going to be make a great nation? Why should the Egyptians say, and you, can, and, and you can see, Moses is starting to get it. Why should the Egyptians say, it is with evil intent, he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and wipe them off the face of the earth? He knows what God can do. So why should the Egyptians 
after they consolidate themselves, go, you see, that's what that God did. Why should they get that? Because the Egyptians would now get the glory. Moses is getting it. God gets the glory, not the Egyptians. Because this is at stake. This is still a battle with Egypt. The battle with Egypt hasn't finished yet. Who gets the glory at the end? Egypt or Yahweh? And Moses recognizes this. Yahweh must get the glory. Egypt cannot. And then he says to them, he says to God, turn from your fierce anger and relent and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. He uses Jacob's new name, Israel. To show this ownership, this promise. After Jacob wrestled with the angel, from now on you will be called Israel. To whom you swore by your own self. So now he's going right back to the Abrahamic promise. You made a promise. So if you made a promise, you are bound by that promise. So now, it says, you made this promise, I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and I will give your descendants all this land I promised them, and it will be their inheritance forever. Then the Lord relented and did not bring on the people the disaster he had threatened. Why did he relent? Moses recognized character, the character of who God is. And God went, okay, now you have seen it. Now I've got something to work with. <laughs> you have seen who I am. I'm a fierce God, but I'm also a God who has promised and who has made covenant. So he grasps this, he understands this. But now, a couple of things just around this whole is that as time went on, the Jews began to understand this event as a form of a creation event. Where Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, they were in the presence of God, this place where heaven and earth met. Sinai was also seen as a place where heaven and earth met. And in the very presence of God, what did they do? Sinned, just like Adam and Eve. Uh, in the Babylonian Talmud, the Babylonian Talmud, the Talmud is the commentary on the law that the Jews wrote, the Babylonian Talmud, meaning that it was written in Babylon and post-Babylon, um, they talk about that, that every Jew on the planet, whether it's still to this day or not, but back then, they said every Jew that is alive bears one twenty-fourth responsibility for the golden calf. I don't know how they worked that out, but, but what it essentially means is that we are still responsible for the golden calf. Because that is our thinking. We have golden calf thinking. We gravitate towards that. So there's a recognition here that there's not only just this original sin, but from Adam, but it's ratified at Sinai. Give us another chance to be in that intimate presence with you, Lord, and see whether we will be able to perform. And what what do we do? <laughs> exactly what Adam and Eve did. <laughs> okay. So, so is God justified in um, doing what he does? Yes, he is justified. He chooses to kill 3,000. God's justice must be affected. There must be something to say. This is not acceptable. 3,000 are killed. Aaron's not killed. And that is one of the questions that, that I think I will be asking God one day. Why not Aaron? Maybe Aaron will say, 
please don't raise that topic. <laughs> I don't know. I have no clue. And um, some commentators have attempted to try to come up with an answer, but, but it, it really is just surmising. We don't know. God is God. God is sovereign, and God chose. He, he chose that Aaron was going to be the high priest, and that was it. Nothing was going to taught that. So, but we don't know. Similar with David, yes. Hmm? David sinned tremendously, um, um, yet God said, um, man of my own heart. Why? I, re I remember my Old Testament uh, professor saying that David was, um, back, in the, back in those days, Saddam Hussein was very sort of, he was quite popular to compare somebody as evil. And he said he was like a modern day Saddam Hussein. He had blood on his hands. God even said, you're not going to build my temple because you've got blood on your hands. David was not a nice man, but when he recognized the character of God, God went, yes, you have it. But Aaron and this would have blood on his hands because of those 3,000 years. Yes, Aaron did have blood on his hands. Yes. And how, how they recognize it in the commentary of the Babylonian Talmud, they recognize it and go, yes, no, we all have blood in our hands. 3,000 died as a portion, but we all should have died. But Aaron, yes, Aaron, Aaron did hold blood on his hands. So Moses has to come down. Um, he meets Joshua halfway down. Joshua says, well, there's noise in the camp. Maybe there's battle cry. Maybe they won the battle and so on. And Moses goes, no, none of that's happening. These are unfaithful people. And Moses is coming down with the Ten Commandments. He sees us. He um, throws them, which he shouldn't have done. But we do know that Moses does have a bit of a temper. Um, and when he was asked to um, um, touch the rock, he struck the rock. <laughs> uh, he throws the tablets. Um, He's angry. He's fuming. We also know that back in Egypt, when he saw one um, uh, uh, Hebrew fighting another, he goes and kills the one. I mean, this guy has a bit of a temper. Um, he needs some therapy. Uh, <laughs> yes. He needs counseling. Yes. Yes, he needs counseling. Um, he goes, he um, um, takes a golden calf. He has a ground down. And then he makes the people drink the water with that the gold is in. Um, maybe some medical people nowadays would say, oh, yes, now that would probably have some, bene some benefits for you because you've got gold cleansing you out. I don't know, but anyway. Um, but he makes them drink this. You can see how angry, how fuming he is. But this anger is, it's, it's more of a righteous anger Versus this other brutal anger. It's more of a righteous anger, but it's still not right. Because God is the one who will deal with it. And he tries to obviously deal with it to get them to understand how bad that they've, that they've done. Now, God calls him back up the mountain. So before he's called up the mountain. Um, this one thing here I wanted to... Uh, Yes. Um, in verse 22, where Aaron's saying, do not be angry, my Lord, etc., and that's verse 22 to 24. Yes, verse 22 to 24, yeah. It's like Aaron's almost saying, trying to make excuses for himself. Oh, yes, now Aaron is definitely making excuses yeah. for himself. It reminds you of the creation story. Well, well spotted. Like Adam made excuses about yeah. Eve. Um, Aaron's making ex making excuses. The people made me do it. <laughs> he's not taking responsibility. No, he's not taking responsibility. So you can see why why in the Babylonian Talmud that they saw this as a since a second creation story. Mm. 
okay, because it follows the same pattern. Okay. Uh, before we, he goes back up, um, he tells the Levites to go and kill. He reestablishes the priestly role. So Moses is doing this. Levites, get out your swords and go and kill whoever has caused this. And maybe a side word saying, just leave my brother. <laughs> But go and kill those. So the Levites take charge again. Now, now he's called back up the mountain. Um, so this is the seventh time that he heads up. And um, picking up from verse 31 of chapter 32. So Moses went back to the Lord and said, Oh, what a great sin these people have committed. He's now gone down. He's seen it. He's he's." Try to take whatever in, and he realizes this is a massive sin. They have made themselves uh, gods of gold, but now please forgive their sin. Now, please, but if not, then blot me out of the book you have written. Okay, so now blot me out the book of the book that you have written. This is the book of the covenant. You've written the book of the covenant. We are not part of this. So this, um, so Zeriri, let me write so that you can see how it's actually written. Um, <laughs> I've always struggled to say this word. Caesarean, 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 Caesarean. Uh, that treaty. Can you make it sound like Caesarean? Can you make it sound like Caesarean? Uh, Jan, Jan, because you are um, intelligent with a turbo. <laughs> You're able to read that. <laughs> so, um, get me out of that. So, so um, if he's in this, he understands that the implications are the greater party has authority over the smaller party, they will provide everything for them based on that they obey. They have signed this treaty already and they've disobeyed it. Now, within the confines of that treaty, the greater party has the authority and the right to wipe out the other. You know, well, we're not going to exist. Maybe, maybe let's just pretend that this never happened. <laughs> Sorry for this sin. You know, can, can we just get away from it? Now, what you start to see here, Moses backing away again. What he had done at the burning bush. Well, I can't do this. Mm. I can't do this. Now, he's going back on this default of... Have I really understood the character of God? Moses has seen how bad it is, how fierce Yahweh can be. Um, um, he's tried to fix things at the bottom. He's tried to reinstall the Levite class, the priestly class. He's tried to fix things up as best as he can. I'm going back up there. Please just forgive us. But you know, if that's not going to happen... Call this treaty quits. You go your way, we go our way, and we'll just one in the desert or maybe go back to Egypt. I don't know. But so Moses starts to doubt the character of God. Uh, so now we carry on, verse 33. Then the Lord replied to Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. God says, I will do that. That's not up to you. That's, that's not up to you to raise the issue. I will take out of the, um, um, the covenant. Verse 34. Now go, lead the people to the place I spoke of you, and my angel will go before you. Okay, my angel will go before you. Now, earlier, it had, um, God had said he, he will send his angel ahead. 
but this is leading up to something a little bit worse. It's not just the angel going ahead, but he also says, um, just hold that thing with the angel up there. It says, however, when the time comes for me to punish, I will punish them for their sin. And the Lord struck down people with the plague um, of what they had done uh, or what they did with the calf Aaron had made. Then, and we don't know when that happened. Okay, but we know that 3,000 were um, killed by the Levites. Um, so whether that includes that at all or not, or there was a separate time, we don't know. Okay, beginning of verse of chapter 33. Then the Lord said to Moses, leave this place, you and the people, you. Okay, you brought up. Okay, at this point, yeah, let's test you again, Moses. See whether you understand God's character. Whom um, you and the people you brought up out of Egypt and go to the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So God says, okay, I'm happy to keep that, but these are your people. Now, it says testing Moses to see whether he, he understands that he is part of this covenant, part of this promise, or has he excluded himself already in his own thinking because he has said, then blot me out of this. Has Moses got the thinking in his head, I am no longer in God's covenant? God wants to test him. Now, how many times have we, when we have sinned and we've done whatever, that we start thinking to ourselves, if I die, am I really going to go to heaven? Ever, ever, ever had that thought? I've had that thought many times. Until um, um, when I was learning to fly, the one day I was coming into land, and it was um, landing on the airstrip had an easy approach from the south and from the north was a difficult approach because we would come in over a township and there was a guy who had a permanent fire burning because he knew that when you came over quite low, it would interrupt with a small aircraft um, your uh, approach. It will cause you to rise, raise probably about half a meter. I mean, in your mind, you think that you'd be going through the clouds, but, but it would interrupt your, uh, your approach. And if you're fairly new at landing, um, messes up your thinking now whether he had done this intentionally at all or not or whether it was but we thought he was doing it intentionally and i'm coming in and there's and there's a crosswind so you crab the aircraft um so you flying into the wind um, um and and you offset um what will take you off off course and coming in and bounce up like a, and at that moment things i had done wrong came to mind um, I'm supposed to be thinking about flying. They come to mind. And I think, if I crash this plane and I die, I'm going to hell. It's almost guaranteed. Because um, I'm going to crash this plane. It's going to burst into flames. I'm going to die in those flames. And I'm going straight to flames. <laughs> uh, I decided not to do a touch and go. I just taxied in and I just said, I think that's enough for today. <laughs> because it affected me so much. Everything I thought about from that day onwards or, or from that moment onwards for the rest of the day was all about, sure, I'm so glad I walked away from that landing. I didn't die because I was, I was going to go to hell. See, I was not thinking about the character of God. I was thinking about my character. And this is what Moses is doing. He's thinking about his character. So, God says to him, carries on, he says, I will, I will send my angel before you and drive out from you the Canaanites, Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hephites, Jebusites, all the arts and bites. And, and go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go with you because you're a stiff-necked people and I might destroy you on the way. Yes. Now, Moses, deal with that. Let me see whether you know who I am. And so Moses 
tells this to the people when he comes down. He tells us to the people, and the people heard, uh, when the people heard these distressing words, they began to mourn, and no one put on any ornaments. Well, I'm thinking to myself, because they didn't have any. <laughs> <They wouldn't. laughs> but anyway, whatever ornaments they had, they didn't put on any ornaments. For the Lord had said to Moses, tell the Israelites, you're a stiff-necked people. If I were to go with you, even for a moment, I might destroy you. And they had seen that happen in Egypt. So they knew that this was very real. It was a very real possibility. Now take off your ornaments and I will decide what to do for the Israelites. So God is like, you sort yourselves out? But I'm not coming with you. Because if I do, I will destroy every one last of you. And Moses is left with this. And he must now decide is God that kind of God? Is he the God who has doomed him to eternal destruction? Has he really brought them out of Egypt and forgotten about the promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Who is he? We don't know how long it takes before this conversation happens. Um, from verse 7 onwards of chapter 33. And this is where we're going to be spending a fair amount of time over the next couple of weeks, is in that conversation. Because Moses wants to know something about God. He comes back to God. Let's just read it and we'll close here. It says, this is verse 7. Now Moses used to take a tent and pitch it outside the camp, some distance away, calling it the tent of meeting. Anyone inquiring of the Lord would go to the tent of meeting outside the camp. And whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people rose and stood at the entrance of their tents, watching Moses until he entered the tent. As Moses went into the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and stay at the entrance. While the Lord spoke with Moses, whenever the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, they all stood and worshipped, each at the entrance of their tents. The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Then Moses would return to the camp with his younger assistant Joshua, son of Nun, uh, did not leave the tent. So you can see Joshua is kept, very much so being prepped. Now we know that Moses has gone to this tent and he speaks to the Lord. Moses said to the Lord, you have been telling me, lead these people. Now he's, he's coming with the thing of you must lead them. Obviously Moses has gone away, he's thought a little bit. <laughs> I'm just going to lead these people, but, he's not gonna come, but God's not going to come with me. He said, lead these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name, and you have found favor with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways, so that I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. So Moses has had some time to calm down, deal with some of his anger issues, deal with some of his doubts, and he comes to the Lord now, and, he, and, and here comes a prayer. It's a very significant prayer. And, and I think that many of us have prayed a prayer similar to this when we found ourselves in that, in that place of doubt. Can God really do this? We, we says to him, I know, um, you have said, I know you by name, and you have found favor with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways so that I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Teach me your ways. Teach me. Because I don't know them. I'm totally lost. I don't even know what I'm doing. And at that point, God says, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. In other words, Moses, you can breathe a sigh of relief. I actually am going to go with you because you've recognized who I am. I says, back at the burning bush, you didn't recognize me. I got angry with you. I had to get Aaron to go with you. 
Now you're coming back, you're saying, who's going to go? with? Well, Aaron's not going to be the one going with you. Joshua, you're training up. But I will come with you. And so he knows, okay, he's going to come. Then Moses said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. He recognizes now. Now he's back on track again. Moses is back on track. How will anyone know that you're pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? So he's back on track. Egypt is not going to get the glory. He's not outside the covenant. Everything is back and again. God is going to deal with this. And he puts him, himself clear in center with, with who God is. What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked because I am pleased with you and, and I know you by name. I'm pleased with him. Why is he pleased with him? Because he's believed him. Okay? Once again, a repeat of the Abrahamic story. God credited Abraham with righteousness because he believed him. Moses believes God and there's righteousness. Then Moses asks the question. And the Lord, uh, um, uh, verse 18, then Moses said, now show me your glory. I want to see who you are. He's now gotten to that point. Now I really want to see you. Who are you? We have all this other understanding of who you are. I'm confused. I've got the story of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I've got the rescuing of um, the people during the time of uh, Joseph. Uh, there's the rescue from Egypt. Rescuing at the springs of Mara. Uh, there's coming to Sinai. There's all these things. And you're a God who has a covenant. You're a God who looks on upon us favorably. You, you're the God who loves, but you're also a, a God who's ferocious. But I need to see this glory. Show me. And God says something to him. This is where we will dwell now for the next couple of weeks. We'll look at each of these words where, where God says to him, um, and the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you. I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. And I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. And, and he tells him what he must do. And we drop down to um, chapter 34. And when God proclaims his name. Um, in verse 6 it says, and he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished, and he punishes the children and their children for the sins of the, of the parents of the third and fourth generation. Okay. We will spend, we will dwell there for, for, for a couple of weeks, looking at each of those words. They are very, very special. And that passage is the most quoted passage in the Old Testament, either in part or in full. So what do we take away from this? Um, we'll talk about that once we'll turn the camera off in a couple of moments. Um, and um, we'll get a chance to talk around that as to what does that mean and those who are watching on, um, online, think about it. So what does this mean? Um, God, in the midst of a chaotic situation where we mess it up in a massive way, will still come to us and reveal himself as to who he is. Let me turn off. <laughs> 